Welcome to this rapid revision video looking at 19th century advances in surgery. There's going to be quite a lot that we can cover here, but I'll try and keep it to under 10 minutes. Firstly, let's remind ourselves what surgery was like in the early 19th century. It was pretty unpleasant as this illustration shows. Firstly, the patient would not be anaesthetised. They may have been hit over the head or given some alcohol, although not for amputations as it made the heart beat too fast, or just given a wooden block and a strap of leather to bite on, and probably the last bit would be the most common procedure. The surgeon would not take precautions to in uh, prevent infection. That's not reckless, that's because the cause of infection remained unknown until germ theory in the 1860s. There'll be another video on that. Speed was the key here. The main causes of death were pain, infection, blood loss and shock. Speed helped with both the pain and the shock. The patient would be held down and a rope or cord tourniquet would be tied around the limb to be removed in the case of an amputation. The surgeon would cut deep down to the bone in one swift movement even using a curved knife. The flesh would be pulled back to reveal the bone. The surgeon quickly sawed through this bone Remove, removing the limb. The pulled back flesh is stretched over the bone to form a stump. Blood would be pouring out over the surgeon's apron at this point, assuming he was wearing one. The wound would be cauterized by hot irons, or perhaps ligatures would be used to tie off blood vessels, although these easily became infected. The stump would be wrapped with bandages to soak up any remaining blood. Only then could the tourniquet be cautiously removed. The patient would be left to recover. Success was about 50-50, with infection from unwashed tools common, as was shock from lo the loss of blood. So what were the dangers of 19th century surgery? Well, quite simply, as we've just been over, there's pain, infection, blood loss and shock. All of these things could be absolutely deadly, and all of them, at least to some extent, were overcome during the 19th century. Let's start with pain. A possible breakthrough in the 1840s was a new anaesthetic, ether. This could make the patient unconscious, but if too much was used, it could actually kill the patient. It was also highly flammable at a time when many lights were using open flames. So a better way had to be found. Ether was too dangerous to use for both the surgeon and particularly for the patient. This is where our first really big breakthrough comes through. James Simpson and chloroform. Like so many good ideas, supposedly, it all started with a massive booze up. Enter the scene, Scotsman James Simpson. There he is. In 1847, Simpson and some friends had been experimenting with some different chemicals by inhaling them to say wit. Sorry, I lost consciousness there briefly, just like uh, Simpson did. When Simpson and his friends woke up from their lack of consciousness, they had spitting headaches and a hangover that would slay a moose. However, Simpson realised he'd found something significant. The chemical that they had breathed in was chloroform and it had put them quickly and painlessly and yet temporarily to sleep. They realised that it had anaesthetic properties because some of them had sustained minor injuries as they had collapsed down, but they hadn't been able to feel a thing. Simpson was a doctor who specialised in treating women and expectant mothers. Simpson was distressed by the numbers of women who were suffering and dying in childbirth. So Simpson and his friends were experimenting to try and find an anaesthetic and they succeeded. They discovered chloroform by chance, but they were looking for such a chemical. Simpson published and shared his ideas. However, despite its usefulness as an anaesthetic, chloroform was not initially supported by everyone. It was popular with many women though. Anaesthetics are true lifesavers. They prevent a mother from feeling excessive and dangerous pain, which itself can cause panic and danger to both mother and baby. Also, should any difficulties occur in the birth, anaesthetics can allow the midwife to deal with them in a calmer, more precise manner. Clearly, many expectant mothers were delighted with the development of this anaesthetic. But not everyone was. Let's take the opinion of the church, for example. Anaesthetics are sin. God made childbirth painful as a punishment for mankind after Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden. If God had wanted childbirth to be pain-free, he would have made it so. For we humans to intervene in such matters is against the will of God Almighty. Then we've got the Queen. Here's what she thinks. Her Majesty most definitely supports the use of chloroform in the relief of pain during childbirth. 
Indeed, indeed, Her Majesty partook of the chloroform during the birth of both Prince Leopold in 1853 and Princess Beatrice in 1857, with most agreeable effects. It is therefore important that it is offered to other mothers in labour. And here's the thing. The Queen was not only the most famous person in the entire country, she was also the head of the Church of England. And so many of the Church's objections to chloroform dried up once the Queen had shown her support. So chloroform was a highly successful, if still quite risky, anaesthetic. Here's a different one though, nitrous oxide, otherwise known as laughing gas. This is another important anaesthetic, although not as crucial as chloroform. Laughing gas was first used medically in 1844, but didn't become popular until the 1860s. Its advantages was that it was reasonably safe, and it had an analgesic effect, which meant it was pain relieving rather than being a true anaesthetic. The patient remained awa awake and responsive, although the pain was dulled. It had disadvantages though. It was not a general anaesthetic, so it was rarely used to put a patient to sleep. And it can have unwanted euphoric effects, like a drug, hence why it's called laughing gas. It's also not as powerful as later anaesthetics like chloroform, and it didn't work on everyone. But as we've seen with ether, chloroform and laughing gas, at least some of the pain has been dealt with. Pain wasn't the only problem though. Infection needed to be sorted too. So making surgery cleaner was vital. Now we're going to look at Lister and antiseptic surgery. Our next important figure in the history of surgery was Joseph Lister. Lister found a way of helping prevent infections. It was rather unpleasant for the surgeons, but it saved lives. He used carbolic spray during operations to prevent infections. So how did he do this? So what did Lister discover? He discovered that even after successful operations, patients died as their wounds became infected. Lister solved this problem. And that gives him importance, both short term, because then longer and more complicated operations became possible as the danger of infection was reduced, but also in the longer term, other doctors built upon his ideas. Later hospitals and operating theatres became cleaner, all of the, equip the equipment in the room was sterilised with his car carbolic spray. Later on this was developed further to get rid of the infections uh, altogether, which we call aseptic surgery rather than antiseptic surgery. His background helped. More of his patients survived. The percentage of his patients who died after operations fell from 46 to 15 percent. His ideas spread and were used by other doctors, although many doctors had at first been reluctant to believe his ideas and some quite prominent people and universities lectured against them. However, in 1867, Lister read Pasteur's work on bacteria. He thought that bacteria might be causing the infections. And so this is where he got the idea to use his carbolic spray to kill the bacteria. And that's what we call antiseptic surgery. Let's have a look at the pros and cons of the use of carbolic spray. That means the good things and the bad. Firstly, the pros. Lister's spray was first used in 1867. It reduced fatalities in his operations from 45% right down to 15%, a really dramatic improvement for the time. It was partly inspired by Pasteur's germ theory, demonstrating that bacteria causes infections. Carbolic spray killed that bacteria. It was used to wash equipment and the surgeon's hands, which made surgery cleaner. But there were disadvantages too. It stinged and irritated the lungs when breathed in, and it irritated the patient's wound too. It made the surgeon's hands sore, blistered and cracked. The surgeon therefore found it quite uncomfortable to use, and many didn't like it as a result. Lister didn't wear specially sterilised clothing, as we can see in that artist's impression at the top, so there was still a significant infection risk by modern standards. And it didn't go so far as an aseptic surgery where the entire operating environment was made germ free. It was later superseded by steam cleaning, which sterilised equipment without the nasty side effects of the carbolic spray. So it's definitely progress, but we have to manage our expectations a bit. So following on from our demonstration earlier about early 19th century surgery and how it was, we're now going to look at late 19th century surgery and decide whether this is change or continuity. So first of all, the patient was anaesthetised with chloroform and anaesthetists stayed close to increase the dose as necessary. This is certainly progress from before where patients were not anaesthetised. Also, there are specialist tools. These are sterilised with carbolic acid before the operation. Well, nothing was sterilised in our early 19th century surgery. So again, that's progress. The surgeon was qualified and professional, but did not yet wear specialised or sterilised clothes. 
Well, this is partly continuity, because again, we've got surgeons just wearing whatever they would wear day to day in order to perform the operations. But they have got better qualifications and they're more respected than they had been before. Carbolic spray was also used to sterilise the air over the wound and the hands of the surgeon. Although this was unpleasant for the surgeon, and it could be quite unpleasant for the patient, it was preferable to the risk of infection that came before. So overall, we've got quite a lot of progress so far, but we're not done yet. The anaesthetised patient, as a result of this, no longer needs to be held down. The surgeon can work more carefully and slowly and therefore perform deeper and more ambitious procedures upon the patient. The wound, therefore, can be carefully stitched up with sterilised stitches or ligatures. The risk of pain, infection, blood loss and shock have all been greatly reduced. And that shows that there has been really significant progress in the region of 19th century surgery. So to put these different breakthroughs into a bit of a timeline. In 1798, we got Edward Jenner with vaccinations. This prevented smallpox and saved millions of lives and eradicated the disease. That's important, but it's not entirely relevant to surgery. I'm sure you'll agree. But then in 1847, we do get something that is very relevant to surgery. The chloroform anaesthetic is discovered by James Simpson. Therefore, the surgeons could take longer to perform operations. There was less pain for the patient, but people still died because of infection. Then in 1861, Louis Pasteur writes up his germ theory. This suggested that bacteria and germs cause disease. It took time to convince everyone, though. But this leads to further progress in 1867 with Joseph Lister and his antiseptics. This greatly reduced the risk of patients dying of infection. Germ theory was still not accepted by everyone, though, and not everyone accepted Lister's methods either, despite the fact that they showed that they were safer. But then by 1882, Robert Koch is identifying diseases based upon specific bacteria. Using the germ theory, he identified diseases such as typhoid, and he could now develop further vaccines. It also showed better how people were getting sick from specific bacteria during operations too. Our final points then. Progress in the 19th century solved many of the dangers of surgery. Pain was relieved through the use of anaesthetics such as ether, chloroform and nitrous oxide. Infection. This was less dangerous when the cause of infection, germs, was understood. Lister's carbolic spray was effective in sterilising tools and environment for antiseptic surgery. Blood loss. This was helped because the anaesthetics kept patients more calm, allowing less blood to be lost and giving surgeons time to hygienically and carefully stop the bleeding. And shock was reduced. With less pain and less blood loss, the risk of fatal shock was drastically reduced too. I think I said I'd try and keep this video in under 10 minutes, and I've clearly fa failed in that respect, but we've covered a lot of ground, so I hope it's been worthwhile. Anyway, thanks very much for watching. That's the end of this particular rapid revision video. Please drop the video a like if you found it helpful and subscribe to the channel for more. But for now, I'll say good health.